On the 11th of September, 1648, a petition was handed into Parliament. It was entitled, The Humble Petition of Diverse Well-Affected Persons Inhabiting the City of London, and, allegedly, had amassed somewhere in the region of 40,000 signatures. The following year, a similar petition, entitled, The Remonstrance of Many Thousands of the Free People of England, gained nearly 100,000 signatures. Given historians estimate the population of London at this time was around 350 to 400,000, these were significant numbers. Circulated through Puritan churches and the occasion for mass rallies, these documents stirred up great fervour in the radical religious climate of the late 1640s. It had particular purchase with the soldiers that made up the New Model Army, an independent political force that was the basis for the defeat of Charles I in the First and Second English Civil Wars, and the buttress upon which Oliver Cromwell governed England. Arising at the end of the First Civil War, these petitions posed a challenge to Cromwellian rule. Their adherents pushed for significant constitutional reform, and failure to acquiesce to these demands could result in mutiny, taking away the base of Cromwell's power. The petitions were the work of the levellers. They were not an organised party or political movement, but rather a group led by figures belonging to the middle classes who shared similar religious and political convictions. Their thoughts leaders were the army chaplain John Lilburn, academic Richard Overton, and the silk merchant William Walwyn, whose ideas were disseminated through talks and pamphlets. At the core of their theology was the conviction that, in the words of Richard Overton, By natural birth, all men are equally and alike born to the like propriety, liberty and freedom. And as we are delivered of God by the hand of nature into this world, every one with a natural, innate freedom and propriety, as it were writ in the table of every man's heart, never to be obliterated, even so are we to live, every one equally and alike to enjoy his birthright and privilege, even all whereof God by nature hath made him free. Lilburn likewise argued that every particular and individual man and woman that ever breathed in the world since Adam and Eve are and were by nature all equal and alike in power, dignity, authority, and majesty, none of them having, by nature, any authority, dominion, or magisterial power one over another. According to the levellers, all people are created equal by God. They share the same birthrights as everyone else, and so no person is superior or inferior. All are intrinsically equal as a matter of nature. This was an extremely radical doctrine for early modern England. The hierarchical structure of English society was justified according to an idea developed in medieval Catholicism, the great chain or ladder of being. This idea was that the world consists of things which are ontologically divided into higher and lower tiers, moving from pure spirits at the top to matter at the bottom. So at the pinnacle of the chain sits God, perfect being itself beyond time, space, and matter. Then, in descending order, there are angels, immaterial beings. Then humanity, which is a conjunction of an immaterial soul and a corporeal body. Then there are animals, who have bodies capable of consciousness or sensory experience and motion. Below them are plants, which are able to 
receive nutrition and grow. And finally, minerals, which lack the pillars of life. Within these categories are also gradations of higher and lower beings. Seraphim, for example, were higher than cherubim. This also applied to human beings. The words of the Victorian hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, articulate this idea. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, God made them high or lowly, and ordered their estate. Each person is born higher or lower within the natural order of the world. Some are, by nature, inferior, others superior. Some born to rule, others to serve, and this is a quality intrinsic to their being. Such an idea was codified by King James I of England in his Doctrine of the Divine Right of Kings, a much older idea that he articulated with new verve. The notion that God has ordained or predestined those to rule before they are born, and so their authority to rule comes not from the people, not from elections, not from popular support or the army, but from God. Thus, they are only accountable to God. No earthly power has the right to constrain the monarch's living or policy. As the king is God's chosen representative on earth, disobedience to his will is not just an act of rebellion, it is treason against God and the natural order. Indeed, disrupting the natural order, usurping the king's place as one's own, causes chaos. We see this in Shakespeare's play Macbeth. The divine source of authority cascades through the social order. The noble has a right to certain privileges and riches because they were destined to their position in the hierarchy, while the peasant farmer is ordained to live out their life at the bottom of the chain. Such ideas were extremely topical in the 1640s because Charles I, James I's son, had ruled according to his father's doctrine, and his apparent tyranny in matters of religion and politics had roused the parliamentarians to declare war upon their sovereign. Thus, when the levellers taught that all people are ontologically equal before God, that there are no inferiors or superiors by nature, they were attacking the metaphysical foundations of English society. As all humans are equal by nature, no one has a God-given or inherent right to rule over another person. They contended that the only basis for hierarchy was consent. One could govern another if, and only if, that person had agreed to be ruled, and this arrangement was only legitimate, providing the consent remained in place. If a subject no longer consented to be ruled, then the sovereign no longer has the right to govern the affairs of their subject. Seeing the defeat of Charles as an opportunity for constitutional reform, the levellers argued for a kingless government freed from the unelected House of Lords, as the positions of monarch and noble were held on a hereditary basis without the consent of the people. In its place, the levellers wanted a representative democracy, in which the people elect their MPs to the House of Commons, thereby ensuring that the government was held accountable to the English people, their sovereign. Its only basis is one of consent. Moreover, they fought for a fairer distribution of parliamentary seats across England, as in the 1640s, most seats were in the South. They also campaigned for these elections to take place on a yearly basis, thereby ensuring that the consent of the people was continually asked for by Parliament. The electorate was to be expanded to, to quote, 
all men of the age of one and twenty years and upwards, not being servants, or receiving alms, or having served the late king in alms or voluntary contributions. When given the consent to rule via elections, Parliament was to defend and enshrine the natural rights of every English person. First and foremost, they argued that all people should be treated equally and impartially under the law, levelling the law, you might say. Lilburn had argued that the free and fair society enjoyed by the Anglo-Saxons had been crushed by the Norman conquest of 1066. The French colonists constructed an unequal society by reserving certain exemptions and privileges for themselves via the legal system. These had persisted to the present day, such as when MPs and lords used their right to arrest and torture an individual without evidence, or when the king, lords and national church had special privileges, such as the right to impose taxes on others without consent. What was worse, the proliferation of laws and their preservation in Latin meant that it was impossible for the English people to attain justice under the yoke of Norman colonisation. Thus, the levellers argued that as all people are by nature equal, no one had the right to exemptions or special privileges before the law, without the consent of the people, and this was conditional upon the consent of the people remaining. Moreover, all people had the right to a fair trial without exception. The laws of the land should be simplified and translated into the common tongue, so that justice could be administered by local communities, thereby ensuring fairness and justice for the people of England. Just as the legal system had been used by the Normans to suppress the natural rights of the English people, so too had they used the church. Although the Protestant Reformation had gone some way at repealing the power structures of the religious establishment, clerics still continued to overcomplicate theology, in so doing maintaining ownership over matters of religion, and using this to persecute anybody who disagreed with them. As God alone is the master over the spiritual, the levellers campaigned for freedom of expression and religious toleration. They contended that all religious minorities should be tolerated, including Jews, Muslims and atheists, providing that these groups do not seek to cause violence or threaten civil society. It was, of course, every man and woman's birthright, given by God, to follow the dictates of their conscience. Finally, the levellers argued that all people had the right to trade freely without arbitrary legal or political barriers, and that all people had the right to use their own property for themselves. No king, noble or parliament could take one's property without the consent of the individual. Though the levellers believed that the essence of Christianity was the golden rule, love thy neighbour as thyself, and on this basis urge the rich to help the poor, they did not advocate enforced redistribution of wealth. Reading the Bible through the lens of common sense and reason would, they thought, convince the wealthy to share their possessions with the impoverished peoples of England, their equals. Following the first level of petitions to Parliament, in 1647, Cromwell, recognising that many of his soldiers were sympathetic to the cause and, thus, were a threat to his power, sought to resolve the situation through what became known as the Putney Debates. These were forums within which Leveller Army representatives discussed their ideas with the chief commanders of the New Model Army, whose headquarters were in Putney, London. The levellers pushed for the equality of all peoples before the law, religious toleration, an end to conscription, and a fairer distribution of parliamentary seats, and they saw this 
as the natural extension of what they had fought for in the civil wars. This was what they were promised by Parliament when they had gone to war against their king, and they were here to get it now. However, their demands were ultimately rejected by the army grandees. Henry Ireton, the chief delegate for the army establishment, swung the debates by highlighting an apparent inconsistency in leveller doctrine. The levellers believed that the franchise should be expanded so that all men over the age of 21 could get the vote. They also held that all men had a right to own their own property. But, Ireton argued, if all men had the vote, this could mean that all men might vote to abolish private property. The same logical flow could be applied to other natural rights defended by the levellers. Representative democracy can be used to violate equality under the law, religious toleration, freedom of expression, and even the right to vote. The radical potential of representative democracy to legitimise communal ownership of all things was a step too far for the army leaders as it drastically undermined the structure of English society and, by extension, the great chain of being. The Putney debates were, then, a resounding loss for the levellers, and from the conclusion of the discussions, their influence in English society waned. With little prospect of success, followers began to drift to newer, more radical movements, such as the Diggers and the Quakers. Things reached ahead when, in 1649, a few regiments of the new model army mutinied in support of the leveller cause. They were quickly crushed by Cromwell, with their support in the army destroyed and their leaders imprisoned. By the early 1650s, the levellers were no longer a substantial force in English politics. And yet, the damage was done. The levellers had shifted the Overton window of 17th century politics in England. They had made it a viable position to believe that all people are made equal by God, and, as such, society should be restructured to reflect this reality. The laws of the land should be levelled, so to speak. Within 40 years, John Locke would be writing his defence of similar principles with a much more positive reception from the English establishment and society. This was possible because the ideas he espoused had been gestating in England since the level of petitions of the late 1640s. And, in many ways, their vision of humanity has won out. While the great chain of being has been consigned to the dustbin of the past, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted by the United Nations in 1948, ordered that all nations should recognise, quote, the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family, end quote. The leveller anthropology of humanity, as one of equality, has come to dominate the modern world.